So I've got the starter here on the bench. And uh, I'm going to take this back cover off. What I expect to see in here are the brushes. And um, so what I'm, what I'm suspecting happened is I'm suspecting water intrusion got in through here on this. And that this is going to be all corroded in a mess inside there. Which rust, iron oxide, it's conductive. So there actually could be enough rust in here that's causing the short. And what would be wonderful <laughs> would be if I was able to actually take this apart, clean it all up, and put it back together, and it worked. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be that lucky. And I'm going to need three eighths. So this is a hoot. Um, it's not three eighths. And it's not five sixteenths. So it's eleven thirty seconds. Wow. That don't beat all. That's eleven thirty seconds. That doesn't fit. Here's a three eighths inch socket out of this set. Fits pretty good. I think it is three eighths, which begs the question, what the heck was wrong with that wrench? This tubing wrench fits way too loose for three eighths. And it's a craftsman. That's uh that's not good. This is a uh what is this thing? This is an old KD tool dog leg three eighths I've had for like ever. That's not too bad. But actually this craftsman three eighths socket is fitting about the same. Eh, I don't know. I guess I should stop fixating on the stupid wrench size and just open it up. Oh, look at the... <laughs> look at the rust on this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can just hear the crunchiness. Plenty of rust. Plenty of rust. I was like a James Bond villain. That's actually not as bad as I thought it would look. That is. Yeesh that corrosion on there <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing this is bad I mean not like game over bad but oh. Oh. <laughs> spider just ran out was running away I killed him before yeah before you can make a break for it. Well, he made a break for it. I killed him before he could get away. Oh boy. So this, uh, this doesn't seem to want to turn at all. Oh, I don't like this at all. You know, this is the support bearing of the, uh, this end is actually in here, which is completely exposed. Could be seized right here. Because this came off, there's an oil light type bearing in here. You can see it. So, I think I should definitely put some penetrant or something on this and let that soak. Let's use some gravité. Well, the good news is it's going down inside there. It's almost like some kind of slip washer or something right here on this side. It's going to keep me from being able to really spray anything in there, I think. Well, let's see. Anyways. Uh. 
I don't really want to. I was thinking maybe I could grab this with vice grips, but I'm worried if the vice grips slip and I mar that up, then it's going to cause a problem for. Well, actually, this only comes out this far. So I should be able to grab it over here and not have to worry about it. <laughs> there she goes oddly enough it almost appears like all right that's backing right out of that so can i pull this out of here no i can't because the brushes and everything are in the way so i don't want to do that i don't want to get silly Er, so what if, and I'm just spitballing here, what if I just back this out far enough to get some lube in there on that bushing, that, that, that bearing, clean this, well actually that's pretty clean, put a little bit of lube on this, spray that electrical cleaner in here on these brushes and everything, slap it back together and see what happens. I'll tell you something else. This cover has a major dent in it. Actually, more than one. Almost looks like, right there, it looks like somebody was bashing on it with a hammer. So, if I put this cover flat, it doesn't, it doesn't lay flat. So that's a problem. So it's no wonder that water can get in there. Right here, right in this spot right here, where this is all peened over. That looks like heck. That's really sticking out far. But this is a nice flat surface I can put it on. Actually, I can do even better than that. I can, uh, I can do this instead of on my bench. I can do this on the floor with this beater block as my template. It's actually like, I'm gonna try to flatten this out a little bit. All right, all back together and as good as new. <laughs> well. Gentlemen, time to place your bets. All right, so yesterday when I was down here messing with this thing, after I put it back together, I did a resistance check and I didn't like what I was seeing. So um, I now have gotten my better meter. This is my Fluke 87. Uh, and it's a better quality DVM. And here's what I'm seeing that really is not good. So right here, there's a some bare metal exposed so that's a good ground uh, right here is the lug coming out of the solenoid going through this this is a no insulation on this this is a solid conductor that goes through this grommet looking thing into the case if I do a resistance check from the case to this lug I'm reading a basically a dead short you see it's 0.6 ohms well at 0.6 ohms that's actually my my lead resistance is 0.4 <laughs> so we got a short in here which explains why from here to ground i was reading zero volts when the solenoid was closing because essentially <laughs> you know you cut no voltage drop across here because of the resistance is virtually nothing so I'm gonna have to open this up and see what the heck's going on with this thing. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna recheck the resistance with that cover off just in case there's something weird going on with the cover causing some kind of a problem. Well, that's interesting. Nope, all right, I just had a bad connection there for a second because of the rust. We'll still get zero ohms here, or virtually zero. So what the heck's going on with this thing? All right, I'm not seeing anything obvious. So um, I think that with this back cover off and those long bolts out, that I should be able to separate this whole front section and the rotor from the rest of this case. Uh, it's probably just stuck on there from being on there so long. Let me get a uh, marring mallet. Let's see if we can't pop this out. There we go. Oh, we got all that rust in there. Wow. 
So these lines right here, okay, uh, these shouldn't be filled with rust. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to be my issue though. We'll set that off to the side. So now with this assembly out, uh, these brushes are now not making contact with anything. So that's uh, opening up the circuit. So I'm going to check that resistance again. Getting a higher reading of an ohm. Not much, but it's something. So we've got these metal plates in here. Right here. There's four of them. They sit on top of these coil packs. These are windings. There's strapping, heavy metal strapping, that's linking those together. So you get the power comes in here, and then right here there's a connection, there's a screw head right there that's connecting this wire that goes over to that coil on this particular pole. And then there's also this heavy metal strap that goes over to that metal shoe, for lack of a better term, that metal plate on this pack. So it's quite an interesting design that I'm not really familiar with. This brush right here appears to be grounded. There's a braided, uninsulated cable right here that goes right over to this rivet. So that brush appears to be grounded. This brush is sitting on this non-metallic shoe, uh, non-metallic holder. Okay, so this brush is not grounded. This brush goes to, goes down around and can't tell if it goes to a winding or if it just goes, it might just come right over to, the, to this shoe, to this brush. And then this brush is grounded like the other one, which would make sense because every time, you know, one set of these contacts lines up correctly, it's basically going to energize one of these uh, poles on here. I wonder if this is just all this iron oxide in here that's causing the problem. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? I mean, look at look at this. All right, big old chunks. And that's more than likely because it's rust iron oxide it's probably electri electrically conductive all right put it in the parts washer brushed it with a nylon brush cleaned out a lot of the heavy stuff it's still pretty much a mess in there I then took it outside used compressed air and tried to dry it out some still quite a bit of uh, cleaner in there though and um, then I noticed that the way this is constructed, these four poles right in here are held in by these big screws. So if I remove these big screws, I can actually slide that whole unit out. That's why this is slotted. So this, this can all come out this way. Although, actually I see a problem with that. The brushes. The brushes appear to be riveted in. Oddly enough, there's one screw here. Alright, so I see that one screw would allow me to disconnect this wire that goes to one of the windings. But then on the other side, oh, okay, actually on the other side, there isn't a connection. So that almost makes it look like everything's supposed to go out that way. But, that's not going to work because of this. Oh, I see. This metal bar right here, there's a copper strap right there. So if I take that screw out, that'll separate. That'll separate this from that. So there is a way to get all of that stuff to go out that way without having to remove these brushes, the brush holders, which is good. All right, so I might end up doing that. I haven't decided yet. 
But I know a little bit about starter construction and electric motors. This would be an induction motor, right? So, um, like that old uh, Leonard Skinner song. I know a little. <laughs> I know a little about starters. And baby, I can guess the rest. So, um, well, maybe not the rest, but enough. I'm going to take out these two screws right here, which will uh, release this retaining plate, which will allow me to take this out from this housing. Um, it'll make it a little easier for me to work on this. And not only that, but I'll be able to get to see behind here and see what's in here, if there's some sort of a bearing or something that should be packed with grease or what. Right now it's probably packed with rust. Eh, not really. Not much to see actually. Alright, so I took this as a took this assembly out of the, the housing so I could clean it up even better. Um, I don't want to use uh, you don't want to use sandpaper or anything but oxide because that oxide dust is going to get in here and cause problems for you. Uh, I guess you, maybe you could get away with it if you're just going to make sure you rinse this really well uh, afterwards with a, a, a solvent that will wash all that away. Um, I just used a scotch Bright pad and cleaned it up as best as I could. And I also removed this fibrous washer that goes on the back side here so that I could clean this end area right here because that's kind of an area that kind of can trap stuff and cause problems. All right. So back in the uh, old days, matter of fact, a lot of starter rebuild shops still have antique testing equipment um, called a growler, uh, which was a special machine that you lay, literally could take this and lay it on the machine and rotate it, and it would actually test the uh, commutator, and uh, worked really well. I don't have that, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my ohm meter. Now, <laughs> we're dealing with very low resistances here. Um, on an electric motor that's running off of AC, uh, it tends to be larger resistances, but because we're dealing with a, a 12 volt system here, they're very low resistances. So what I want to do is I want to do a resistance check between one of the bars on the commutator and the one that is directly across or 180 degrees away from it. And I'm going to take that measurement and then I'm going to repeat that process all the way around. And I want to see the same resistance for all of these. It's going to be a very low resistance, but it should be the same for all. If I see a change anywhere, that would indicate a damaged um, um, commutator winding. So. That's test number one. And then test number two that I'm going to do, I'm going to take a resistance from one of the commutated bars to the one right next to it. And then I'm going to do that all the way around. And again, I should see the same resistance. I'm not concerned with what the value of resistance is. I just want to see that it doesn't change. So in order to make my life easier, I'm going to hold this between my legs so I can eyeball straight down and, and do this test. All right, so I completed that test and didn't see anything unusual. The resistance was very, very low, about three tenths of an ohm, but it stayed that way pretty consistently. All right, so I finished those checks. Those were good. So now the other check I want to do is I want to do a check from any of the commutator bars to any of these laminated stacks or these laminated bars right here. And what I would like to see is I would like to see infinite resistance. Um, instead, I'm actually getting a reading. You can see it's uh, over 250,000 ohms and rising. But what I think I might be seeing there is, I think I might be seeing resistance that's, uh, that high resistance might be due to residual parts cleaner because I could still see that this is still pretty wet even though I tried to blow it out with air. So I think uh, what I'll do is I'll um, I'll see if I could fit this in my little, I've got a little, an old toaster oven I use here in the shop for heating up things to, for different, you know, reasons. And I think if I give it a cook in that toaster oven, cook off some of this, maybe that'll uh, solve that issue. Well, the overall length on this is just a little bit too large for my, uh, my little toaster oven. So 
I'm going to use this heat gun. I'm going to use it on the low setting. I haven't been doing that very long, but just for the heck of it, um, let me just see what kind of a reading we get now. If I see that the resistance is increasing um, dramatically, then I would say that we're probably going in the right direction. Well, now that's interesting. The resistance has actually decreased. That is not what I expected to happen. The resistance now is down around 120 K ohms. Oh boy, the more I warm this thing up, the lower that resistance drops. Now it's down to, you know, starts at like 60 and creeps up. That, that is weird. All right, so I just went outside and uh, blew it out with compressed air again. I don't know whether or not the air cooling it caused the resistance to come back up or whether or not it could be that when I'm heating this, I'm sweating uh, parts cleaner, you know, that's down in there out and then just blew it off. But now, you know, it starts at like over 400 and... 70 k ohms and this 500 this is over 500 k ohms over half a million ohms resistance has gone up a lot I, i'm at this point tempted to just slap this thing back together and see if it'll actually run maybe i'm overthinking this i don't know i do know one thing i found the starter online last night it looked like it might be the correct starter for this tractor and uh it was like $250. All right, I've reinstalled the starter. Um, got the battery cable hooked back up, all the wiring hooked back up here. So you might be wondering why did I bother going through all the trouble of putting the starter in if I don't even know if it's gonna work. Well, I have to ground the starter anyways to get the circuit complete. And the easiest way for me to do that was to just bolt it back in. So might as well just Put it all back together so now in the moment of truth well that that's a big improvement <laughs> i think this starter might be uh okay after all all right uh i just saw the fan turn about a quarter of a turn before i go any further i'm going to pull the plugs on this thing and spray a little bit of uh, lube down in the holes one of the tools that I wish I sometimes wish I had was uh, would be a uh, bore scope. One of those uh, you know those doohickeys that the snake thing you stick it down into a, a hole or a tight space, and it's got a little screen you can even record on them. But I'd love to be able to stick a bore a bore scope down there and see what the cylinders look like. But that looks pretty good. That one looks good too. Looks good. This, I think, is the cylinder that when I originally got the tractor had no compression because the valve was hung open. That one looks fine too. All right, so. I think what I'm gonna do is, curious if these plug wires were on correctly. They should still be on, have been on correctly. Firing order is stamped right on the uh, side of the, it's cast right into the side of the block. Uh, it's one, three, four, two. So that means if this is number one, and then that means that this one should be number three, and it is, and then this one is number four, and it is, and then this one is number two, and it is. So the firing order is correct. So looking at the top of the distributor cap, we're, we're going clockwise, and you just pick whichever one is number one, and you start and you count and you go around and see if it's the proper firing order. So that's all good. So, you know what? I'm not going to... Those cylinders, those spark plugs look devoid of any rust whatsoever. I'm not going to spray anything down those cylinder holes after all because the next thing I want to do is a compression test and I don't want the fluid from the... I don't want this thrust penetrant going in there and giving me a false reading or making a mess squirting out those holes when I do the compression test. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over a little bit, make sure I don't hear any bad noises. All right, 